here at EV Revolution in Amsterdam. I'm talking to Colin McEverer, a Canadian from uh, Bloomberg Energy. And you gave me some really practical information about uh, what's going to happen. Let's go through them uh, for a moment. First, batteries. How fast uh, did the batteries go down and what do you predict for the future? So battery costs have come down almost 80% since 2010. Our team has been gathering a lot of data on this for quite a while. Uh, we think the battery cost curve is going to continue to come down, but it's going to slow down a little bit because of rising material costs. Cobalt. Yeah, cobalt, lithium, nickel. A lot of these are have really spiked in the last little while. So it's still going to keep dropping, but probably at a slower rate than we've seen over the last. Yeah, I mean, we had 24%, so maybe it will be 15%. Yeah, we still think it drops around 10% this year and, and on into the future at, at, a, at a similar sort of 10 to 15% rate. But actually, we do it according to an experience curve. So not an annualized reduction, but according to the volume that we see. So the volume keeps going up. Yeah. Volume creates an incentive for innovation and drives further cost reductions, drives further improvements. So we see that continuing. Yeah. And we think that gets you to cost competitive EVs beginning around 2025 on an upfront basis. Okay, based on the battery costs. You yeah. also said that uh, based on... Uh, the uh, prediction you have about the amount of factories, it will double into uh, from now to 2021? So the amount of lithium ion battery manufacturing capacity goes from a little over 100 gigawatt hours today to over 300 gigawatt hours by 2021. A factor of three? Yeah, sort of two and a half to three. It's going up fairly quickly. And it's not going to be the United States who's dominating? China's building the most, but everyone's still trying to stay in the race. So the, the gigafactory in the US, the Tesla's got now activated. Uh, and as well, there's a number of projects that are going ahead in Europe. But yes, the majority of the capacity, the new capacity that's being built is being added in China. Okay. 2025 is when you predict that uh, the capacity, that the price of the combustion engine will be the same as electric. Uh, is there a lot of doubt there? Can it be uh, two years earlier or two years later or uh, because of other manufacturers? Yes, yeah, certainly. It, could, it come, could come slightly earlier or later. Look, a really big spike in battery material costs would push that out further. Yep. So uh, the cobalt cliff, some people refer it as, if, if, if demand goes up really fast but supply can't respond on some of those key materials, then yeah, that, that could get pushed out. Alternatively, if the volume goes up sooner than expected, that'll push battery costs down again faster. And is batteries the real uh, problem? I wouldn't because, say so. I mean, I see, I see so many manufacturers starting extremely slowly. Mm, I wouldn't say it's... A problem, I would say, battery costs are what battery cost reductions are what are what is enabling this big change. So, we see that continuing to improve. If you look back over the last 50 years, we've put more and more processing power into smaller and smaller devices that we carry around. That's created a need for better and better energy storage. That's why the phone that you're filming on. That's why the phones that we carry in our pockets yep. have really good lithium. No, no, no but I mean, so now, now it will keep improving, and keep and there improving. are spillover benefits for that between. Yeah. But let me, let me ask you, you are analyzing the manufacturers, you know, the Volkswagens uh, and, the, and the Fords and the, uh, these cars. How serious are they really transforming their production capacity? Because apart from the cost, mm. they need to build these factories. How fast yeah. are they doing that? Well, I mean, the automakers now all have pretty aggressive plans in place. Um, so certainly that's changed over the last year. You're seeing much more aggressive commitments from automakers to electrification. Yeah. I think pretty much every major automaker now has... Uh, significant EV programs. Some of them are building platforms in which they'll be able to make many vehicles off of. Some of them are just making still EV variants of their existing ICE vehicles. So I think that's kind of one dividing line you can see. The ones that are building a whole new platform that they're going to launch many vehicles off of are taking that quite seriously. But certainly we see the commitments from major OEMs rising and rising as, as the market grows. If it then goes to uh, the amount of kilometers which are driving, we had uh, Tony, uh, Toby uh, coming up on stage saying in 2030, 95% of the kilometers will be fully autonomous driving cars, and fully electric. You are a lot more uh, conservative. What do you expect for 2030 in the terms of amount of sales and amount of kilometers? Uh, the amount of sales of self-driving cars. No, this is the electric cars in 2030. I think you were thinking so we're about... A quarter of, vehicle, of global vehicle sales, but certainly higher in some parts of the world. So around a quarter of global vehicle sales being electric in 2030. That's our, our kind of base case. Yep. Um, and I think, look, I think saying that every vehicle sold after in 2025 is going to be electric is just incorrect. It's, that's not the way it's going to evolve. This is still going to take quite a long time. And is that an academic exercise or what do you see? I, I don't think it's an act. I don't want to comment on other people's work in terms of how they've done it because I don't. It's know. not gonna. It's gonna. It's, you think twenty five percent is a much more realistic, and you had fifty percent in two thousand. In twenty forty, our base case is fifty percent. Now, after twenty thirty, it gets very hard to predict, right? And and the degrees of freedom are, are very high. But certainly, 
um, the next few years, it's going to rise rapidly, but this will still take time. There's large parts of the world where EV sales in 2020 are essentially still going to be 0%. So big chunks of the world where that are not even part of it. And yes, when the economics get good, those will start to rise quickly, but it will still take time. We're heading towards a much more differentiated global auto market today than in the past. And that's a real challenge for automakers because in the past they've sold, made one vehicle that they can sell in many markets. With these changing so quickly, you're going to end up with some countries leaping ahead, but some countries still taking very long time to really get going on EV adoption. Let's talk. It was always California, Norway and the Netherlands. It was, and the rest was a desert. How does life look now for EV countries? Yeah, it's definitely spread out. Um, there are still those pockets of adoption. Um, the big one that's different than you go back a few years is, is China, of course, right? So um, you, you, when you go to Shanghai or to Beijing, you can really feel it. You can, you can see it on the streets and you can see, you can, when you go there, you really understand all these different layers of government that are pushing, the national government, the regional government, the city level government that are pushing this forward. So that's certainly something that six, seven years ago wasn't a big part of the story. Now is, is probably the biggest part of the story. Any other country in sight which you see uh, per coming up on that big four? Um, I think Germany is quite interesting. Sales there last year almost doubled. Um, a very low perspective. Yeah, from a low base. But uh, again, I think once the various vehicles that the German OEMs are launching, that launch calendar really kicks off around 2020. Um, so whether that's Porsche or Daimler or, or VW really kicks off around 2020. Yeah. I think you might see the German market start to go quite quickly as well. The moment that uh, the Volkswagens and the Daimlers and that kind of stuff really start producing. And they're investing real money. You look at a group like Daimler, the EQ line, they're putting a lot of resources behind it. They're pushing it hard. I think those vehicles will sell very well in Germany. Um, they actually predict that uh, they are at 90% uh, uh, autonomous driving electric connected vehicles by 2030. So they, they, they published that in, uh, in Mobile World Conference. Okay. And I thought that was quite aggressive for such an uh, you know, old big huge company that is very aggressive i agree yeah. okay then you say hey um, evs are one thing uh, buses are already a huge uh, are already a big demand too uh, how much percentage of e of batteries is that at currently so about last year around a third of global lithium-ion battery manufacturing manufactured volumes went into buses now it's slightly different chemistry but so that's pretty significant source of demand and that's really just driven by china so you have one third of total the, the production of EV goes into buses. Yeah, of EV battery demand went into buses. Yeah, so just under that. But so that that segment has gone really fast. Again, the government subsidized that very heavily and has since pulled that back. Also because there was some fraud in in a number of those vehicles that ended up claiming subsidy but never getting on the road. Yep. So that has slowed down a little bit. But again, it's still it's actually still moving quite quite quickly. So. Then uh, other chemistry of batteries, uh, is there anything, I mean, it is a lithium ion, is there anything in the next 10 years which is uh, on your radar? I think that there's a certain amount of lock-in to lithium ion batteries right now based on that capacity data that I was showing during the presentation is that a lot of that is built and is going to be built. There's going to be a strong in incentive to use that. Um, there are a lot of automakers talking about being able to introduce solid state batteries around the mid-2020s. It's hard to say right now whether that's realistic or whether that's just something they hope will happen. How big is, uh, I mean, Bloomberg Energy is very progressive. I mean, so based in the, uh, based in the, research, uh, in the research groups, Bloomberg is a progressive and, and, and quite uh, you know, enthusiastic on EV. How big is uh, Bloomberg Energy forecasting in, your, in, in the total Bloomberg uh, uh, company? Bloomberg New Energy Finance is a group of about 200 analysts around the world looking at D disruptive changes in the energy sector. So the energy transformation, we call it. So there we're looking at, there's teams looking at things like wind, solar, energy storage, electric vehicles, um, new mobility business models. So we're a somewhat separate from when people think of the, f the, the Bloomberg. Not a journalist, no, the, or just the a research. Yeah. But yeah, so we're about 200 analysts. Yeah. And how, how big is EV? Uh, a team of about 10 people altogether covering EVs, and uh, new mobility topics. Do you see a huge spike now of your uh, of your services? Do you see, I mean, because you will be uh, ahead of the market, uh, so I'm just using it as a prediction of demand. Yeah, certainly we see a lot more interest in, in all of our work on these topics right now. Do you think this is a big change, this whole electric uh, thing? Is it, an, uh, global, is it an evolutionary change or is it a really big disruptive, disruptive change for this market? It's a, I mean, it's absolutely a big change. Um, having said that, a lot of the expertise that were valid for the previous generation of vehicles are some of it's quite valid and important for this generation of vehicles. So the ability that big global automakers have to operate at scale, 
to churn out thousands of vehicles day in, day out with a very low defect rate, that's still important. People still want reliable cars that are well built. So the skills that the global automakers have built up in that are still very relevant and are still very important. Last question, the whole autonomous driving uh, revolution on top of that, which you know would put the percentage up, uh, usage up, how important will that grow? I think that's it's important. Um, I, I'm a bit more skeptical of the timelines for when fully autonomous vehicles can be bought by everyday consumers and used. I think the real impacts on that uh, don't come until the latter half of the 2020s or even into the 2030s for when that starts to impact automotive and, and energy. Um, but certainly so when, when Mercedes and Daimler says in 2021 we will sell level five, uh, you think that might be true, but it will be very small numbers or you think it will be too expensive or what, what do you I, think? I think it could be a combination of both. It'll, for one, it will probably start at the high end and, and, wor and work its way down. Um, we've also seen a lot of automakers kind of back off really aggressive statements on level five autonomy in the early 2020s and more of them saying actually the latter half of the 2020s. So I would just be a bit careful with statements that you'll definitely be able to buy all of these vehicles in, in a very short time. I think this will have a very big impact on, on how people get around, but I think it probably just takes a little bit longer than some people are saying it will. Thanks for a great presentation.